Thomas. Come out here, Tom. This is not doubting Thomas, but this is Tom. And uh, I've known Tom now for a long time. And uh, we went fishing the other day, and he caught more fish than me. Oops, sorry. Come on, buddy. No, you're right. But uh, Tom, really looking forward to what God's put on your heart. Amen? Thank you, Chen. Thank you so much, Neil. I really appreciate that. And I do want to say, Neil, I just appreciate your announcement so much. I've known, I think it's nearly 35 years now, maybe 40 close that we've known each other. But I just want to say, Neil, that I'm just impressed with who you've become as a man of God. Uh, I'm just so impressed with your humility. The thing that impresses me most is the times that I've just seen you on your face before God seeking God. Uh, I, can, I can submit to a man who does that, and I'm just so pleased with are going to have a month of seeking space. That's wonderful. Uh, you know, we live what we believe. We we'll become who we believe. And many of us, you know, we believe about God, we believe things about God, but there are three things, there are three aspects of what we believe that we've got to get right. First is we've got to believe God is who he says he is. Rather than being reactive to circumstances and blaming God, we've got to know who he says he is. Secondly, we've got to believe who he says we are. And he says a lot about that. And I want to look at, explore a little bit about that this morning. Then we've got to believe about what God says about others. It's so important because you will get what you believe. It's a law of the spirit. What you believe is what you will get. It's what you will receive. It's what you will uh, just land in your life. So you can think one thing, but if your heart is believing another, you'll get what your heart believes. If you, if you believe that you've got a miserable future, well, you lose hope. And guess where you end up? You end up in misery. But that's not what God says. It's so important that we believe what he says, not what we just think intuitively or what our circumstances say or what has been spoken into us. We've got to believe what God says to us. When I was a young man... I had the great privilege of hearing the word of God preached with life and with power and something was imparted into me. I asked Christ into my heart. I asked him into my life and it was like a light switched on on the inside. The grass was greener, the sky was bluer. It was something divine happened to me. It was just an, an amazing experience to be born again of the spirit, the Bible calls it. We are born again. You know, we are not sinners saved by faith. If you believe you are a sinner, then you will sin. By faith, you will sin. We were sinners and we are saved by faith. But once we're saved, we're no longer sinners. We are new creations. Are you hearing me? 2 Corinthians 5.17 If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new all things are of God. I'm a new creature. I'm no longer a sinner. I've been born of God. Something divine happened. The seed of word of God was birthed in me and I became a new creature. I'm created according to God in righteousness and true holiness, it says in Ephesians 4.24. I am created righteous. I don't have to try to be righteous. If you have trouble with a sin habit in your life, maybe it it will help you if you look at what you actually believe about yourself, that what God says about us. So it's so important that you see this right, that what God says about us, it's a subtle form of pride to believe something different than what God says. Whether it's you know based on in insecurity or what has been spoken into us or whatever, we've got to take a hold of what God says about us. I'm a new creature. You are a new creature. If you've received Christ, you're new. We've got to see ourselves from this place of identity in him. God has been speaking to me so much about this identity thing. I've been just rolls around in me and I, every day I lift my heart towards God and I see another aspect of it. It's so, it's so powerful. I live what I believe. Let's have a look at the word of God here just to prove that I'm not just making this stuff all up. Ephesians. Let's turn to Ephesians. Ephesians 4, 24 says, 22 to 24, put off the old nature, put off the old man, put off that old thing which is corrupt. You've got to put that to death. 
God has one answer for sin, it's called death. It's got to die. You don't cover it up and pretty it up. It's called death. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and lusts. Strong language. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man which is created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. So I put on the new nature. I put on the divine nature. And then it starts to spell out in Ephesians all that what holy living looks like. Don't lie. Don't steal. You know, and it's almost a, a paraphrase of the Ten Commandments. Give to one another. Honour one another. But then it starts talking about our identity. And I want to look at our identity about who we believe, about who we are, according to what God says. So let's look at this. Ephesians chapter 5. Be imitators of God as dear children, walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. And then it says, put away all the, all the rubbish lifestyle, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. Don't even let it be named among you as fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. And it, and it goes on and talks about this holy lifestyle. We are children of the light. And it then gives a fruit of the Spirit to find out what is acceptable to the Lord. Have no fellowship with all that stuff. When I was a young man, uh, when I was a sinner, I sinned. Strange that. <laughs> it's true. When you were a sinner, you probably sinned. When I got saved and I became a new creature, I put some of that stuff away. It took me a bit of a while to put all of it away, but I put it away. I put away drinking alcohol. So I got saved out of that. I don't want to go back to that. I don't want to go back to that lifestyle, that culture. I got saved out of that. So I, I stopped drinking when I was 18. Stopped drinking when I was legal. <laughs> Put it away. I, the Bible says, Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit. Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. It gives us an alternative. Jesus said, whoever is thirsty, come to me and drink. We've got to learn how to drink from that supply, friends. We've got to learn how to drink from him. It's far more fulfilling than going to the pub, I can tell you. And, and learn to drink of the life of the Spirit. And if you hunger for God, he will meet with you. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. So I've found that if you press into God, which we're going to do at these prayer meetings, God will meet with you. You will have encounter with God. He wants to meet with you. His desire is for us. It's not just so that we know about him, it's so that we know him. Hello, you hear me? Okay, he wants us to come into this place where we have continual relationship and encounter with the living God. Ephesians 5, let's go to verse 21. Submit to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, is also Christ, is head of the church, and he is saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. So he's talking here about the picture of husbands and wives. But he says, Christ is head of the church. You and I, as members of this church, we're the church, hello? So we need to submit to Christ, who is the head. I used to read this thing and always put it in the context of marriage. But he's talking about a spiritual truth here of how we walk with him. He is the head and we've got to submit to him. Then it goes on and says, we are his body. We are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. We are members of the body of Christ. You are the members of the body of Christ. Christ is in me. Again and again, the scripture talks about Christ is in me. I received him in me. Christ is in me. He's in you. If you've received him, he's in you. And we are members of one another. Therefore, if we're members of one another, it's very important how we treat one another. He's in me. If Christ is the head, what happens from the head? What happens from the head of the home? As a husband is the head of the home, I'm the head of the home. My beautiful wife, we've been married five years now on Friday. And, uh, you know... She's my wife. 
the Bible commands her to submit to me. So my responsibility towards her, which it also spells out there, is to lay down my life for her. So I am the head of my home, which means I don't get my own way. I have to die to my selfishness to meet her need. Am I falling off here? Are you hearing this? So who has the greater deal here? <laughs> but as the head, my responsibility is to provide for her, to protect her, and if she goes out, she goes out in my name. She's taken my name. She's taken all my authority. She gets access to my bank account. Isn't that true? Come on. Christ is the head. It's speaking about our relationship with Christ. Christ is the head. It's his responsibility to protect us, to provide for us. He's already died for us. He will protect provide and give us his authority and we have access to his bank account. Are you hearing me? Come on, this is the relationship that we have with Jesus. We've got to get our identity from him. We take his name. I want to push your thinking a little bit in this. I want to push a, a step further than maybe that you've already gone. We are in him. We are members of his body. Let me use, can I have an example? Greg, can you help me here? Oh, thanks. <laughs> Come up here. <clears throat> we are members of his body and his flesh. I have received Christ into me. Greg has received Christ into him. We are members of his body. We are members of one another. Christ is in me. Christ is in him. Therefore, how am I going to treat him? I'm going to treat him like I would treat Christ, my Saviour. And isn't that what the Bible tells us to do? You keep reading that book in Ephesians, Ephesians 5.29. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake forgave you. So I'm going to treat Greg like I would treat Christ because we are members of one another. Are you hearing this? Well, what if Greg offends me? Well, that's why it says forgive. And so I've got to, it's my choice now to treat him right as members of one another. Thanks, Greg, you can sit down. But you might say, Tom, you don't know how badly I've been hurt. You don't know how badly, you know, people have done and said things to me. Well, I don't read anywhere in the Bible where it says, okay, if you've been hurt this much, then you give, but if you've been hurt this much, then keep it. I don't read that anywhere. Maybe it's in the book of Second Suggestions. You might have read it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't read that. What, what Jesus did while he was hanging on the cross, while they had crucified him and whipped him and put a crown of thorns on his head and mocked him and spat on him and beaten him, Jesus said to those soldiers, Father, forgive them. That's the example that we have to follow. Forgiving one another. Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. You know, sometimes our body doesn't do what it's supposed to do. We're his body. He is the head. I've got a head. This is my body. And sometimes my body doesn't do what my head tells it to do. Have any of you ever fallen over your own feet? <laughs> sometimes, you know, my body just doesn't want to do what it's supposed to do. And that's where I end up, on the floor. That's why we're supposed to submit to Christ who is our head so the body doesn't stumble over itself and we don't end up on the floor in a mess. Are you hearing this? Jesus said, if you love me, just do what I say. 
please, <laughs> if you love me, do what I say so that we don't stumble over one another, so that we don't fall, so that we don't mess up. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted. How hard is it to be kind? Hello? We've got an egalitarian culture in Australia and part of our Australian culture is to knock and to mock one another, take the mickey, sledging, whatever you want to call it. It is so ungodly against what God tells us to do. It's such an opposite to what the Spirit of God says to do. God tells us to be kind. Use kind words. We had the great privilege of having a, a party for my darling wife, who also had a birthday this week. And, uh, you know, just before we, we sang happy birthday and cut a cake and, and all her friends started speaking just positive words to my wife. And I found it just so moving to hear people speak positively about, you know, one another. The Bible tells us to, in humility, prefer one another above yourself. When we understand that we are the body, members of one another, all the one another's come into sharp focus. Love one another fervently with a pure heart. All the one another's start to make sense when we realise that Christ is in you and Christ is in me. We've got to get this identity thing and understand our identity is in Christ. Let me give you an example. I want to push your thinking on this a little bit. <clears throat> Let me say it like this. We are Christ. Did you hear me? We are the members of his body. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst. So we have two or three gathered. I used to think, okay, if I get together with somebody else, I'll get together and we'll have fellowship in Jesus' name and suddenly Jesus will come in. It'll be wonderful. But that's not what he's saying. He says we are members of his body. Where two or three are gathered, there Christ is. It's because that's who he is. We are members of his body. We are his body. That's where Jesus is. You're hearing this? I'll give you a, a bit of a testimony uh, to explain a little bit how to walk in this. Not because, you know, um, just because I've been through stuff. We all go through stuff. I mean, I, I, I'll tell you a little bit. But I'm nobody special. I was pastoring a, a church for 20 odd years, overseeing an area chairman, overseeing another whole bunch of churches had a nice house, five investment properties, um, you know, I was doing okay. Wife, six kids, and it all went south in a very short space of time. Had three different investments that went belly up in the space of a few months, lost $100,000, and uh, then had to sell everything else, lost a million dollars worth of property, all went out the window. Um, you know, I was under a bit of pressure with that finance, the people in the leadership in my church saw me going down a little bit. They decided that was the time to lay the boot in and have a go at me. Um, and, you know, it all just got a bit much. I decided to walk away from ministry. I couldn't handle it. When I walked away from ministry, my wife walked away from me. And so, you know, it went through this really difficult time, went into such deep depression. I had tried 110% to give my absolute best in serving God and it all just went out the window. Now, you know, I, I'm not saying I'm anybody special. We all go through some stuff. I mean, look at, look at Roma here. Beautiful lady, she's been through some stuff, writing a book on it. And look at that beautiful smile. You know, look at all his teeth. Where do you get those from? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's nothing special that we go through stuff. Most of us here have been through some stuff somewhere, somewhere down the track. But the special thing is how we walk out of it. So this is what I want to share with you, okay. So I lost my, I lost my money, I lost my marriage, I lost my ministry, I lost my mind, I lost my motivation. I swore to God I'd never speak in church again. And yet here I am. The grace of God. The grace of God. God, God did a number on me. And I had this, you know, these thoughts would come into my mind of, of condemnation and failure. You're no good, you fail. You've done your best, but it's all fallen apart. Nothing works. <clears throat> you know, you, you might as well give up. 
and I had these thoughts just continually come. Well, guess where they were coming from? They weren't coming from God. But God in his grace dropped this scripture into my heart that Christ in me is the hope of glory. Christ in me is the hope of glory. Hope is a confident expectation that good is coming. I had no clue how good was going to come. But God spoke to me. Christ in me is the hope of glory. Christ is in me. The devil would come and speak into my thoughts, into my head. You're a failure. You're no good. You're condemned. Rejection, hurt, bad, miserable. God, Christ in me is the hope of glory. And I began to identify with Christ in me. That it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Christ is in me. I am a member of his body. Therefore, I am Christ. Are you hearing me? So these thoughts would come. You're a failure. But Christ in me has overcome everything. He's overcome every devil. He made an open show of them, triumphing over them. Christ in me overcame. I might be a total failure, but the Christ in me is a total victor. He's a total victor. Christ is in me. He's the hope of glory. And that thing broke by the power of his spirit. I think I'm going to you here. That, that, that had no power any longer. Fix me up. I think I've broken something. I don't know. I got to the place where it did not matter. The devil could say anything to me, call me anything he liked. Failure, miserable, hopeless, no good, nothing. It didn't matter what he said, Christ was in me. And I began to identify with Christ. Are you hearing me this? Christ in me. So I am a member of his body. I am, we are, Christ. So when the devil was speaking to me, he was speaking to Jesus. It's no longer I who lives. Are you hearing this? It's no longer I who lives. Christ is in me. When the enemy comes and he speaks that sort of stuff in your life, Christ in me. That's who I am. He is the head. I'm not the saviour. I'm not saying that. He is the head, but I am his body. We are Christ. The devil cannot have any power over that. That victory, that fight has already been fought and won. We've got to identify with him. Turn to the person next to you and say, I seek Jesus. Because that, friends, is the truth. You are Christ. Yes, whatever that was. <laughs> we are Christ. Are you hearing that? You've got to see it from the place of identity, not from the place of works. If you just do it from the place of works, Jesus did this, Jesus did that, Jesus come and help me, come and do something, then you miss the point. It's not from a place of works, it's a, from a place of identity. I am Christ, Christ is in me, he is in me, I am in him. That's what it all says all the way through the word of God. Go and read it, Romans 12 talks about the body and at the end of it it talks about, you know, when we get offended with one another, overcome evil with good. It's not about how hardly you've been dealt with, friends. It's about identifying with him. I am a new creature. I'm not an old one. I'm a new one. Sometimes this body, you know... <clears throat> I don't know. A couple of months ago, I went to a skin doctor, and I've had a few of these. My body doesn't always do what it should do. And they found a, a melanoma on me. I couldn't even see the thing. And the doctor said, I'm just going to take a biopsy of that. You've got this tiny little thing and pulled out a little tiny, you know, couple of mils out of my skin, just there. You might be able to see that little hole. He came back and said, that's a melanoma, we need to take more out. I said, why do you need to take more? Oh, just a precaution. So they got a great big square hole in me now. I tell the kids on, on the bus, it's a square mouth shark. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes my body, you know, it, it doesn't function like I want it to. Sometimes there's things. And sometimes we can look at other people 
and think, what are you doing in the body of Christ? I want to cut you out. You're no good. But Matthew tells us, Matthew 7, judge not unless you'll be judged. You'll get judged the same way as you judge. Don't judge other people. Because if you judge other people like that, that's what you're going to get. So if you want people to get cut out of the, of the church or cut out of the kingdom, well, guess what you're lining up for? Hello? Are you hearing me this morning? They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and lusts. All the one another in the Bible. Philippians chapter 2 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Don't do anything out of selfishness or vain conceit. But have this mind in you which was also in Christ, thinking not only on your own things but also on the things of others. To be others minded is the mind of Christ. Not to be selfish, not to have vain conceit, not just to have your own ambition. You've got to put those things to death. Jesus said, take up your cross daily. If he is the head and I have to submit, somebody's going to call the shots and it's not me. I've got to die to my selfish stuff. Are you hearing me? I've got to let my selfish ambition go. And the outworking of going through all that breakdown was Jesus broke my selfish ambition. I've got no ambition, no, no desire to lift myself up to be anybody special, do anything, not asking, didn't ask to come and preach here. It, that's, you know, not looking for position, title, but I do want to serve him and walk with him to the best of my capacity. So we've got to die to ourselves to allow him to be the head. Are you hearing this? He is the head, I am the body. If I'm going to walk with everybody else in the body, we've got to walk step by step. If I'm going to be a foot, I need to have the other foot going in synchronicity, synchronisation, walk in step together. Hello? Are you, this is our body. We are one in Christ. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. We've been one together. That's what God wants us to come to till we all come to the knowledge of the Son of God, to the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ, to come to that place of maturity where we walk together. But hey, Tom, do you know about these other churches, you know, some of these other guys, they think differently than you do. Well, this is the question, are they in Christ? Then why are you judging? Judge not. He's the head, he can sort it out. When I become the head, which is going to be never, <laughs> then it'll become my responsibility. It's not my responsibility, it's his. Hello? My responsibility, blah, 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 that is to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, loving one another fervently with a pure heart. So I've got to get rid of the un impurities out of my inner life. <clears throat> if you've been hurt, friends, I empathise with your hurts. But Jesus wants to come and bring healing. It's like Roma here with that smile. It's like the work of God to me. That's what he's done in me. He brought me joy again restored back to me. Give me a wife who smiles at me. That's nice. <laughs> put, a, put a joy in my heart again. Because I am part of him. I am his body. Putting down my own selfish ambition. Putting down my vain conceit. Putting down this stuff that causes me just to run around and do my own stuff. Do you know it's the people closest to you that can hurt you the most? That's why it's so important that we forgive. All the one another's in the Bible. The Bible says, uh, you know, I think it's in James, it says, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. How many times have you had somebody come to you and confess their faults to you? How many times have you confessed your faults to somebody else? Hello? It's awful quiet. <laughs> But yet that's part of our healing journey. To find healing is to be transparent and open yourselves to others. In the beginning, God created man out of the dust of the earth and he formed his body. But then he didn't come along and kick it and say, get up, time to get up. Sometimes I feel like that in the morning. I wish somebody had come along and kicked me. It's time to get up. 
God didn't do that. He breathed into him a life-giving spirit. We are his flesh and his bones. We come to communion and we drink his blood. In my body, I have blood flowing through me, through my flesh and my bones, but that blood needs to be oxygenated. I need to breathe. Everybody breathe. Okay, everybody stop breathing. You disobedient bunch. So <laughs> we all just breathe. Anybody had a time when you stopped breathing for a while? Not much fun. I was just talking with Roy earlier about sleep apnea, where you stop breathing at night. It's hard to sleep during that when you stop breathing. And it's not much fun. We are the body of Christ. We are his flesh and his bones because he poured out his blood at Calvary. So then we have to, by faith, partake of his blood. But the Lord God breathed a life-giving spirit. We need the spirit of God like we need breath. We need the spirit of God to come and breathe and make us alive. The spirit of God quickens our mortal body. The spirit of God, we need to have it bring life flowing through the blood of Christ through the flesh that is the body of Christ and brings life to us. Are you hearing this? Neil gave that prophetic word this morning about that God is going to come and do something bigger in us. He's about to break forth upon us. It's what you believe, friends, whether you go into it or not. I choose to believe what he says, even though it might not be my experience. I want to believe for it to become my experience and then I will walk in it. We will walk in it by the power of his spirit because his spirit is speaking to us all the time. We need that like breath. The breath of God to breathe through us and breathe revelation and life and victory and wholeness. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Hello. The same spirit, not a different one, not a junior one, not a baby one, not just a part of a one. It's the same spirit. The same spirit lives in you. If I am the body of Christ and the same spirit lives in me, I identify with Christ, then all things are possible to him who believes. There is nothing that's impossible. All things are possible. Because I am his body, I've got the same spirit, I can do exactly the same things that Jesus did, as long as I'm in obedience, he is the head, we just walk in it, and miracles happen. Life explodes around about us. Forgiveness flows. We walk in the grace and humility. If we get proud and think we're somebody special with it, well, guess what? Pride will get you kicked out just like it did to Satan. We can't walk in that. It's about walking with him. In honour, preferring one another. Are you with me still? Revelations 12, 11 says, We overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb. So we've got to know how to apply the blood of the Lamb. There's a difference between the shed blood and the sprinkled blood. We've got to know how to apply the blood and work with the blood of Christ by the word of our testimony. I've given you a testimony today about me, about how God came and he broke uh, that rejection and that failure and condemnation. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who walk according to the law of life in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation because we identify with him. Hello? And, anybody remember the third one? They love not their lives unto death. We've got to deal with our selfish stuff. We've got to deal with our selfish ambition. We've got to die to ourselves. That might sound like a hard thing, but I can tell you for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. And it's the same for us, friends. There is joy on the other side. There is joy on the other side of dying to selfishness. There is such liberty and such joy. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. There is joy, there is joy, there is joy. There is joy, there is joy, there is joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Oh, I can almost feel like dancing. <laughs> there is, oh, can I? <laughs> anyway, <I think> so. <laughs> Greater love has no man that he lay down his life for his friend. If we love Jesus, we will lay down our selfish ambition for him. If we love Jesus, we will lay down the stuff that pushes against him, our selfishness. No greater love has a man that he lay down his life for his friend. 
And for us to love Jesus, you've got to lay down your selfishness. Just do what he says. And it's fun. He brings joy. If you love me, keep his commandments. Jesus said, if we are his disciples, we will have love for one another. By this, the world will know. Not just you, but everybody else will know if you love one another. Does that mean you just smile at one another and give each other a big hug? That's the end result of it. But the real love is overcoming evil with good. Real love is displayed by laying down your life and forgiving when people don't deserve it. Real love is displayed in those hard moments when you come out of misery and hell and find joy again. Real love is displayed by being kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another for, for the same as God forgave you for Christ's sake. Are you hearing me this morning? Come on, there's, there's, there's meat in this. But it comes out of the place of identity. Jesus is in me. We are Christ. He's in you. We've got to learn to walk together. We've got to learn to love one another. Lay down our selfishness. I found it pretty difficult to forgive my wife who had totally rejected me. My ex-wife now. I tried for seven years and she refused to speak to me. Living in the same household, having to just ignore me day in, day out. That was hard. But I tried and today I pray that she would be totally blessed and she would walk with God and she would have all her heart's desire and hold no bitterness against her. Because I don't want to be that bitter man. I don't want to be that old, bitter person full of hurt. I don't want to be. One more testimony. The Lord challenged me and told me to forgive. Told me to forgive. If you don't forgive, that's a problem. So I had to forgive all the people in my in the leadership I, in my church that had betrayed me and turned against me when I was down. I had to forgive them. I had to forgive all the people that had hurt me, I had to forgive my wife, I had to forgive my kids that didn't want to know me, I had to forgive everyone. And I did it even though it was in a constant state of heartache, and just wanted to cry all the time, I just chose to forgive. And I forgave. The thought would come up, the memory would come up, I choose to forgive. The thought would come up, the memory would come up, I would forgive again. Every couple of minutes, I would choose to forgive. Then it became every half an hour, I choose to forgive. Then it became every couple of hours, I choose to forgive. Then once a day, I choose to forgive. I remember that. And I remember the heartache and the pain, I choose to forgive. Then once a week, the thing would come up, I choose to forgive. And then there came the time when I would not remember it at all. I had forgiven and let it go, but I was still in a place of heartache. And I thought, you know, God, how come I'm still in heartache? I've done what you asked. I've forgiven everybody. I pray a blessing upon them. I don't hold offence against them. But I'm still in heartache, God. Then a friend spoke to me and says, you know, I was like that, but I asked, I just asked Jesus to take the heartache because it was more than I could bear. And I thought, how dumb can you be and still breathe? You know, I'd, I'd been walking with God when I hadn't even ever asked him just to take the heartache. So just a simple prayer I just said, God, it's, it's more than I can live with. Can you just please take this pain? I don't hold anything against anybody, but God take the heartache. And in the space of a few short days, in the space of uh, less than a week, all the heartache and the pain had just lifted and it was like, where is that? Where has it gone? Now I'm talking about it, it's like a totally different person. Where is the heartache? Where is the pain? Only God can do that. I couldn't do it. I couldn't let it go. But he let it, he took it from me. God is so gracious and so wonderful. Friends, if you have never received Jesus into your life, I've got to tell you, he is just so lovely. He is so sweet. And he bring, wants to bring that sweetness and loveliness into you as well. He wants you to become a new creature. He wants you to come into this place of wholeness and identity in who he is. If you have never prayed that prayer and you would like to, 
Just give me a wave. That you? I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to lead you through that. Anybody? But God wants to meet with your friends. Okay. If you've identified with some of those things that I was saying today, whether you've been betrayed, whether you've got heartache that you cannot release, whether you've got issues of unforgiveness, I'd love to be able to pray with you and believe with you to release you from those things. The power of God, friends, can set you free when nothing else can. So if we could have the musicians come, if you would, if you would respond to that, if you'd let me come and uh, release the presence and power of God over you today. To let go of heartache, heartache, hurt, offence, stuff that gets in the inside, stuff from the people that are closest to you sometimes. God wants to meet with you so wonderfully and bring a lightness and a sweetness into your spirit. I've got some friends here today. I've got my own cheer squad. They can testify to the truth of what I'm saying. because They've watched me go through it. The power of God, friends. God is greater. The greater one lives within us. Greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. He is a greater one. He is well able. He is well able to bring victory and to bring life. Anybody who would like me to pray with you, please come. Don't hesitate. Come on out. Let me just believe God with you, friends. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Spirit of God. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Father. Rabu Reba Labasha Sugus Labayish. Thanks, Jody. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Spirit of God. Uh, I just sense the Spirit of God wants to touch hearts today. He wants to get deep on the inside. He wants to bring you to a greater place of wholeness because you can't walk into victory unless you've been made whole. You can't walk in to carry something more if you haven't been made whole first. He wants to bring you into this place of wholeness. He wants to deal with it. Thank you, Spirit of God. Thanks, Jody. Let's, let's close our eyes and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Yes, we do. We thank you for your grace, for your presence. We thank you, Spirit of God, for your grace and your goodness. We thank you for all that you've done for us, but who you are in us, Lord. Christ in us is the hope of glory. Christ in us is, is the place of victory and hope. Thank you, Spirit of God, for speaking to us, for imparting to us today. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for touching these lives. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus.